Reviewing for the test, we have our first example, and you are trying to sketch a graph that has the following characteristics. So the first one says f of one is equal to two, but the limit as x approaches one of f of x is four. So graph something that f of one is two and the limit as x approaches one of f of x equals four. So we'll get different sketches. Um, f of negative one is zero, but the limit as x approaches negative one doesn't exist. And then the last example is f of zero is undefined, but the limit as x approaches zero of f of x is negative one. So I'm gonna pause the recording and you, if you're watching this, pause the recording and then try it and then see if you, you got it right. Okay, so let's go through these. So f of one equals two. So you need to know what that means. Well, that's saying when x is one, we have a y value at two. So let's just plot that. So when x is one, we have a point at two. So we've plotted our point at one, two, but it's telling me that the limit as x is approaching one is equal to four. So I know that as we're getting closer and closer to one on the graph, the y value I'm getting closer and closer to is four. But I know that that point is actually though below. And so this is an open circle here at one, four. And I know as, as I'm coming in on the left and the right, I'm getting closer and closer to the y value four, but not hitting that value. So I could have something that's increasing and hits this value and then continues to increase. They could have been decreasing and then increasing, strictly decreasing, but I know I have an open circle at one four and that the graph is getting closer and closer to this Y value of four as we get and come in to one on the left and the right. Okay, so the question was, how do I know that, that this part up here is an open circle? I know that's an open circle because I was given that this right here, f of one equals two. And so this is telling me that one, two is a point on the graph. And so I have already a solid circle down here. If this was closed, then I really wouldn't be having a function. This would have two y values for one x value. So I know because this is already a closed point that this was gonna be an open circle up here. Any other questions? Okay, so for part B, f of negative one is zero. So again, we know that there's this point on the graph. This is saying that when x is negative one, my y value is zero. So first thing I would do is I would plot that point. So when x is negative one, my y value is zero. And then it tells me though, that this limit does not exist. And so if the limit doesn't exist, that means that my y value as I'm coming in to the left is not the same as my y value as I'm coming in on the right. And so it doesn't matter. We just need to make sure that as we're coming into x equals negative one on the left and the right are not the same. And so maybe we have a point up here where we're coming down and then we're approaching x equals one I can write it like this as limit as x approaches negative one on the left. So we put that little negative up there of f of x in this case, let's say is equal to positive one. I already have a solid circle here. So I'm gonna keep this one open. And then the limit as x is approaching negative one on the right, I know has to be a different y value. And so it could be this zero here. So it could look like something like this. Or in this case, this would equal zero. So the left and the right are not the same. And that tells me then that the limit as x approaches one 
f of x does not exist. But again, there, I mean, we could have, we could have had a graph that is a lot different than what this looks like, but has the, the characteristics that there's a point at negative one zero and that the limit doesn't exist. Okay, so our last case says f of zero is undefined. So that means when x is zero, there's no y value. And then it tells me as the limit as x approaches zero, though is equal to negative one. So to me, that tells me, let's look at that limit as we're coming in to x equals zero. My y value that I'm getting closer and closer to is negative one. The problem is again, that this f of zero is undefined. So we know that there's gonna be an open circle when x equals zero. And we know that this actually open circle has to be at zero negative one because this limit, as we're getting closer and closer to negative one, I'm sorry, x equals zero is getting closer and closer to the y value of negative one. So I'm gonna come up here and then continue on. So here's one example of what you might've gotten or similarly to. So the next example is find the derivative of the following functions. And they're both natural log functions. The first one is f of x equals the natural log of e squared square root of x. And then b, we get g of x is equal to the natural log of the natural log of the natural log of x. And so take a moment, pause the video if you're watching this not live and try to do those on your own and then come back and see if you got it right. Okay, so let's try the derivative. Hopefully you were able to get this. We're looking at the derivative of the natural log of e squared square roots of x. We could, if we wanted to break this down, remember if we have a natural log of a product of two things, we can break that down as a natural log of the first product plus the natural log of the second. And so we could, if we wanted to start by rewriting this as f of x equals the natural log of e squared plus, because there's a multiplication in between, plus the natural log of the square root of x. Well, let's just rewrite this a little more. By definition, natural log is log base e. So this is saying, what would we raise e to to get back this e squared? Well, we would raise e to the second power to get back e squared. So the natural log of e squared is actually just two. So we have f of x is equal to two plus, and let's rewrite the natural log of the square root of x. So the square root of x we, we've been talking about is the same thing as x to the one half power. So this is the natural log of x to the one half. Now, again, we can use properties of logs to help this us. Let's bring our exponent down front in front of the log. So we get f of x is equal to two plus one half times the natural log of x. So now it's in the form that it would be easier to take the derivative than what we were originally given. And so taking the derivative now, derivative of two, a derivative of a constant is zero, plus one half and then times the natural log, derivative of the natural log of x. And so that was one over what you were taking the natural log of, which is x, times the derivative of what you were taking the natural log of. So the derivative of x in this case is just one. And so we found that the derivative, you should have gotten the derivative is equal to one over two x. So questions on that one? Okay, so there were a few questions about how we got this two here. And natural log of e squared, um, that's the same thing, natural log is log base e. 
And we're looking at what do we raise e to to get back e squared? And what we raise e to to get back e squared is two. And so that's where we get this two here. There was another question about bringing this a one half down in front. Um, we did this so that we wouldn't have to use the chain rule when we took the natural log, um, derivative of the natural log of x to one half. We used our rules of logarithms that if we have some exponent, log base b of x raised to some exponent is the same thing as the exponent down in front log base b of x. Okay, so let's look at this next one. So before we start that, recall that if we have y is equal to ln of some function g of x, taking the derivative of that, dy dx or y prime, another way to write that. Remember this was equal to one over what you are taking the natural log of, which in our case is g of x in this case, times the derivative of g of x, so times g prime of x. So we're going to use that case when we're taking the derivative of g of x, which is a natural log of the natural log of the natural log of x. So we need to be careful here. We need to look at our outer function. So our outer function in this case is this natural log. So if we're taking the derivative of g of x, we are looking at one over what we're taking the, this natural log of, which ends up being the natural log of the natural log of x times, and I'm not going to do it yet, but let's look at it, times the derivative of the inside. And the inside in this case is d dx of the natural log of the natural log of x. Okay, so let's now take the derivative of that inside. So let's bring down derivative g prime of x is equal to this one over the natural log of the natural log of x times, but when we take the derivative here, the outer function, we're gonna to have to use the chain rule again. The outer function is the natural log. And so this piece would be one over what we're taking the natural log of, in our case, it's ln of x, times the derivative of the inside. So we still have to take the derivative of the inside, but the inside this time is the natural log of x. So let's take the derivative of the natural log of x. So we have one over the natural log of the natural log of x times one over the natural log of x times, well, the derivative of this natural log of x is one over what you're taking the natural log of, which is x times the derivative of the inside. And the derivative of the x is just one. So we can multiply this across. We had have one times one times one all in our numerator, which is one all over the natural log of the natural log of x times the natural log of x times x. I might pull this x in front just so we know that it's not part of the other natural log. And again, this was equal to one. So questions on that one. The next example you guys are trying, you're given a chart um, and the chart says when X equals one, two, three, four, your f of x values are two, four, one, three. Your derivative of f of x is negative six, negative seven, negative eight, negative nine. 
g of x is two, three, four, and one at the respective x values, and g prime of x there are two sevenths, three sevenths, four sevenths, and five sevenths. And so for part A, you're finding the derivative of the composition of g of f of x when x is negative one. Part B, this is saying find the derivative with respect to x of f of g of x, the composition of f of g of x at x equals two. If h of x is a function where it's f of x divided by g of x, find the derivative of h of x at x equals one. And if k of x equals two times f of x times g of x, find the derivative of k at two. So pause the recording and try those, and then I'll go through it. With these, I would first write out the rules for my derivatives. For instance, so I wanna find the derivative of, of y equals g of f of x. And so doing that, I need to use my chain rule. And I know that my derivative, y prime is the derivative of the outer function, g prime of the inner function, f of x, times the derivative of the inner function, in this case is f prime of x. And so here, we're looking at f prime of when x is one. So I'm gonna just write it like this, y prime of one. And so let's go back in and wherever we see an x, we're gonna replace it with one. And so we have g prime, of f of one times f prime of one. So now we're gonna go up to our table and we're gonna figure out what these values are. So looking at f of one. So when x is one, f of one is two. So rewriting this, I have, this is equal to g prime of f of one is two times, it tells me f prime of one. So looking at again, when x is one, but f prime of one is negative six. So times negative six. So this is equal to g prime of two. So we're looking at when x is two, g prime of two is three sevenths. So we're gonna write three sevenths there. g prime of two is three sevenths times our negative six. And so if we multiply that out, well, three times negative six is negative 18 all over seven or it's negative two and four sevenths. Now looking at part B, if we have y is equal to f of g of x, when we take the derivative of this, so one way to write that is dy dx, or y prime. It's the derivative of the outer, f prime of the inner, g of x, times the derivative of the inner, g prime of x. But we want to evaluate this when x is two. And so the derivative of the y when x is two, Let's go in here and plug in two wherever we see an x. So this is f prime of g of two times g prime of two. And so we wanna fill in each piece. We wanna figure out what is g of two. So going to our chart, when x is two, my g of x function, my y value is three. And so let's rewrite this. This is the same thing as f prime of g of two, which we just saw was three times g prime of two. So when x is two, 
the derivative of g of two is three sevens. So times three sevens. So this is equal to the derivative of f of x when x is three. So going over here when x is three, the derivative of f of three is negative eight. So this is gonna be negative eight all times three sevenths, which is the same thing as negative 24 sevenths. Or in, as a mixed number, it's negative three and three sevenths. So to find h prime of one, well, to take the derivative of h of x, I would probably do that without plugging in any numbers yet. I would use my quotient rule. So I know my derivative of h of x, this is equal to the derivative of my numerator, and I can write that as f prime of x, times my denominator, g of x, minus my numerator, f of x, times the derivative of my denominator, so g prime of x, all over this denominator quantity squared. So g of x quantity squared. But it wants us to find h prime of one. So let's go in wherever we see an x, we're gonna rewrite it with a one. So we're looking at f prime of one times g of one minus f of one times g prime of one all over g of one and that quantity is squared. So now all we are gonna do is go back into our chart and we're gonna figure out what the values are for each one of these functions evaluated at one. So f prime of one, so when x is one, f prime of one gives us back negative six. So we have negative six times g of one. So if we look at g of one, when x is one, g of one is gonna be two times two minus f of one. So f of one at x equals one, f of one is two times g prime of one. So if I'm looking at g prime of one, that gives me two sevenths. This is all divided by g of one. So g of one again was two quantity squared. So let's simplify this. I got negative six times two is negative 12 minus, well, two, we can think of that as two over one if you want, two times two sevenths is four sevenths, so minus four sevenths, all over four. Well, we don't like complex fractions, fractions within fractions, and one way we dealt with clearing those was multiplying by that fancy one, and that fancy one in our case is multiplying by the denominator, or at least common denominator of all the fractions within the fraction. In this case, we only have one fraction, so it's seven. So let's multiply each term in the numerator by seven. So this is equal to negative 12 times seven, which is negative 84 minus, seven times negative four sevenths. Well, the sevens cancel, we're just left with a four, all divided by four times seven, which is 28. So negative eight minus four gives me negative 88 all over 28. Well, I know four goes into the, at least both of those, four goes into negative um, 88, 22 times, negative, and four goes into 28 seven times. So this would be negative 22 over seven, or this is the same thing as negative three and one seventh. Here's our h prime of one.
So last one, we're going to need to use the product rule. We have two times f of x times g of x, and we want to find the derivative of k of x, which was equal to that, evaluate it at two. And so let's first plug in and do the product rule before we plug in the two. And so I know k prime of x is equal to, well, let's treat two times f of x as the first function and then g of x as the second function. So this says, I'm gonna take the derivative of the first, so two, that coefficient in front just stays the same, f prime of x times the second, g of x, plus the first, which I'm gonna call it two f of x, times the derivative of the second, and the second in this case, so g prime of x. So now if we're looking at this, derivative evaluated at two. We're gonna go in here and plug in two wherever we see an x. So we have two f prime of two times g of two plus two f of two times g prime of two. So now we can just go in and plug in from the table. So we're looking at the derivative of f of x at two, which is negative seven, times g of two. So when x is two, g of two is three, plus two times f of two. So f of two, when x is two, f of two is four times the derivative of g of x or g of two. So g of two, the derivative of g at two is three sevenths. So let's simplify. We have multiplying straight across. We have two times negative seven, that's negative 14 times three plus two times four, that's eight times three sevenths. So negative 14 times three is negative 42, plus three times um, eight, that's 24 over seven. I know I need to um, get a common denominator in order to add or subtract these. So 42 times seven is 294. So let's multiply negative 42 by seven over seven to get a common denominator. So just multiplying it by a fancy one to get that common denominator. So this is equal to negative 294 all over seven plus 24 sevenths. So larger number is negative, so the result's negative, but one's positive, one's negative, so 294 minus 24 is negative 270 all over seven. We can leave it like that or we can rewrite it. So seven goes into 270. Well, seven goes into 27 three times. Seven goes into 60 um, eight times. So this is the same thing as negative 38 and four sevenths. The next example, you want to sketch a function f that satisfies the following properties. So the limit as x is approaching 1 on the left of f of x is 1. The limit as x approaches 1 on the right of f of x is 3. The limit as x approaches 2 on the left is positive infinity. The limit as x approaches 3 does not, ex um, does not equal f of 3. The limit as x approaches infinity of f of x is negative two, and the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x is infinity. 
So you should be able to sketch some graph that satisfies all of those conditions. So pause the recording, try it, and then come back and see if you got, got it correct. So let's put all the pieces together. So the first thing says that the laminas X is approaching negative, sorry, positive one on the left is equal to one. So as we're coming into one on the left, we're getting a Y value that we're approaching that is getting closer and closer to one. So we need to come up here, getting closer and closer to one. It's telling me though that the limit as X is approaching one on the right though is three. So I know that there's a jump in the graph that X equals one. One of those, if, unless it doesn't tell me, one of those has to be an open circle. And it didn't tell me which one was solid or where it was defined. So maybe an open circle here and then a closed circle at one three. Coming in on the right, we're getting a Y value of three. Coming in and on the left, we're getting a Y value of one. And then it says that as we're approaching two, on the left-hand side, our graph is shooting off to positive infinity. So that tells me I'm having an asymptote here. So at x equals two, then I'm gonna have some asymptote. So this graph over here has to be, as x is going to two, be shooting upward to positive infinity. Okay, so a vertical asymptote at x equals two. The limit as x approaches three of, um, ex exists, but does not equal f of three. Okay, so it doesn't tell me what f of three is equal to, but it tells me that the limit exists and it's not the same value. And so I know I have an open circle at x equals three of where I'm getting closer and closer to. Let me see anything else that I see here. The limit as X is approaching infinity, I'll come back to this. Let's come back to this in a second. The limit as X is approaching infinity is equal to negative two. So to me, that's telling me I have a horizontal asymptote at negative two as I'm going to infinity, negative. Let's see, I know this is coming down and it's gonna be hugging this line as we go off to infinity. And I know at X equals three that the limit exists, but it's not the same as F of three. So maybe an open circle here. And then maybe coming back up like this. And so let's have a solid point above or below when X is three. And I, my case, this is an open circle at three zero. So I need a solid point either above or below. So how about I make F of three one. So the limit, it does exist. It's approaching zero here, but it's not the same thing as F of three, which in our case, I made one. And it says that the limit as X is approaching negative infinity is going to positive infinity. So I don't have a horizontal asymptote there. I know that my end behavior though is shooting upwards as I go to negative infinity, my Y values goes to positive infinity. So I think that we've hit all of those values or satis um, satisfy all of those conditions with a graph that we just made. But there's could have been an infinite different ways that you could have came up with a graph that satisfies the same conditions. So now we're looking at f of x equals x cubed minus six x squared minus 15 x plus one. We're asked to find the derivative of f of x. We're asked to find all the values of x where the slope of the tangent line to the graph of f at x is horizontal, and then find the equation of the tangent line at to the graph at f at x equals zero. 
So go ahead and try it and then we'll come back and go over it together. Okay, so let's take the derivative of f of x. So we can just use the general power rule here. So the derivative of f of x, well, the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared minus the derivative of 6x squared, bringing our power down and multiplying it by 6, we get 12x, subtract one from the power, minus the derivative of 15x is just 15, and the derivative of a constant is always 0. So we did part A, or in this case 1, and we found the derivative. So part B says we want to find out when the values, what values of x, the slope of the tangent line to the graph of, f of x is horizontal. Well, we know the slope of a horizontal line is 0. So we want to find x such that f prime of x is equal to 0. So we want to set our derivative function equal to 0 and solve for that. While we're setting that equal to zero and bringing that down, I notice that I have a three in common with all three terms in my derivative. So let's pull out a three at the same time. So let's bring that down, pulling out a three from all three of those terms, we get x squared minus four x minus five. We're looking at when is that zero? So I have a quadratic and I can factor that, two numbers that multiply to give me my constant negative five and add to give me my middle coefficient negative four. So it would be a negative five and a positive one. So I can factor this as x minus five times x plus one with that three in front equals zero. So now that it's completely factored, we can set each factor equal to zero. Well, three is never equal to zero. x minus five is equal to zero when x is five. Add five to both sides and x plus one is equal to zero, subtract one when x is negative one. So we have two values that are horizontal. Our tangent line is horizontal, five and negative one. So then it wanted us to find the equation of the line tangent to the graph of f at x equals zero. Well, we need to figure out what the slope is when x is zero on f of x. And so we want to look at what is f prime of zero. So going into our derivative function, we're going to plug in zero wherever we see an x. And so doing that, we get three times zero squared minus 12 times zero minus 15. And so we get back, this is equal to negative 15. So I know for the equation of my tangent line, what my slope is. My slope is negative 15, and I also need a point. So we need a point on the graph and our x value is zero. So a point on f of x when x is zero. Well, how we would write that is f of zero. So we wanna go in and we wanna plug in zero wherever we see an x in our original function. And so doing that, we get zero cubed minus six times zero squared minus 15 times zero plus one. And so f of zero gives me back one. So we have a point at zero, one. That's actually my y-intercept, right? And so I actually know what my b value is there. Let me give myself some more space. So I know I have a slope of one. I'm sorry, it's a negative 15. And did not work how I wanted it to. And a point at zero one. So I know the equation of my tangent line is y equals my slope negative 15 times x plus b. 
and my B value is one. So we're just gonna play a little friendly game of Jeopardy here. And so we have the limit strategy for 400, it's instructor against the students. And so our first question, find the derivative using normal strategies. You guys got this. F of X is equal to 19 X squared plus three over X minus eight over X to the fourth power. So find the derivative of that. Okay, so the derivative you said was 38x minus 3x squared plus 32 over x to the fifth. And you guys got that right. Give you guys, be, you'll be team one. So you got 400 points. And so now you want to choose another category. So what category, how many points would you like? We're looking at tangent lines at 100. So find the equation of the, tang um, of the line tangent to the function at x equals three. And we're given f of x is x squared. So the equation of the tangent line of f of x equals x squared when x is three. Okay, so it sounds like that you guys got the equation of the tangent line was y equals six x minus nine. So let's just make sure it's correct and that is correct. So you guys get an extra hundred points. So 500 to zero. Anybody need to see that work done? Let's just walk that one through really quickly. So here we would have just taken the derivative of this f prime of x is equal to two x. We need to figure out what the um, slope is at three. So we're looking at f prime of three, which is two times three, which is six. So we get our slope is six. We need a point on the line. We know our x value for our point. So to find our y value, we wanna look at f of three, which is three squared, which is nine. So we have a point at three, nine. So using either the point slope formula or y equals mx plus b, plug in what we know, solve for b. So nine equals our slope, six times x is three plus b. So nine equals 18 plus b, subtract 18 on both sides, we get b is negative nine. So y equals our slope, six times x plus b, so minus nine. 